Good evening, everybody. I think everybody's in now. Um, I might give it just a, a couple more seconds to let um, any broadband um, adjustments. But it's a very special evening tonight and thank you very much for joining us for this special talk. My name is Francesca Ford and I'm the senior publisher for Architecture Books at Routledge and imprint of Taylor and Francis. It is my great pleasure to introduce you to our author, Petra Chefferin, who is an architect practicing architectural theory and philosophy of architecture and is associate professor of architecture at the Faculty of Architecture at the University of Ljubljana, where she teaches architectural theory and history. Petra and I have been brought together by her recently published book, The Resistant Object of Architecture, A Lacanian Perspective, which was published by Routledge on the 31st of December, 2020. The talk which follows is an introduction to the work in the book, and I know will be extremely interesting, and I'm delighted to have the opportunity to hear Petra speak. There will be the opportunity for questions at the end, so please do type these into the chat box and I will read them out. I have some questions of my own and Petra and I will have a brief discussion after her talk. So without further ado, Petra, over to you. Thank you very much, Fran. Thank you for your introduction. Uh, I'm very glad that you were able to take part in this event. Uh, also because uh, you were the first person that I contacted uh, in, at Ratlich. Uh, and uh, the person also who gave me a first positive response. And, and this was a very good moment for me. Um, I would also like to thank the embassy of the Republic of Slovenia who, or, which, or, who organized this event and especially to Špila Vrbniak who invited me to speak here tonight. And I would like to thank you all for um, attending this <laughs> Zooming here with us. So uh, as Fan uh, said, my talk will be uh, an introduction to my book. And I will also connect um, uh, with, uh, with the theme of this uh, uh, London Festival of Architecture, this year festival, uh, this, this year's theme, uh, which is care, uh, uh, as you probably know. Uh, care for society, care for the environment. Uh, now the questions that were asked were, for instance, how can architecture that were asked in the announcement of the theme, these questions were, for instance, how can architecture be a positive force for change? How can it contribute to reducing social inequalities? How can it help reduce negative effects on our living environment and so on? And we can, of course, only agree that architecture today, when we live in the time when our environment is endangered to such a degree that actually our very survival on this planet is put into question, we can only agree that architecture should in fact act in the way that it takes good care of the environment. And most of us would probably also agree that the project of modern architecture, which was basically the project of building a more egalitarian society should continue today. So one of my starting points is that architecture should act in the way that it also takes good care of the environment and of, the, and of course also society. But to this, I would add the following. Fundamental to architectures taking good care of the environment and the society is that it is understood and practiced as a creative thinking practice. So, in other words, only if it is practiced as a creative thinking practice can architecture actually take good care of the environment and society. And as a creative thinking practice, Architecture works in its given time and space when it is determined by itself. This is a basic characteristic of architecture as a creative thinking practice. It is determined by itself. What does this mean? Perhaps I will start sharing the screen. So that architecture is self-determined doesn't simply mean 
that it develops its projects based on its own theoretical and practical knowledge, based on its history, uh, and based on its own particular methods and techniques. It means, and this is what I put in, in writing because I think it's important to emphasize the, the main point, it also means, so self-determination also means that in developing its project, projects, architecture is driven by the issues and open questions that in the given space and time, it alone sets for itself. And it responds to in the process of its action. And it is these open questions that constitute the firm point of architecture. It is these open questions and the answers that architecture develops to these questions in each particular case, from case to case. So these answers and questions are the driving force of architecture as a creative thinking practice. And because of that, architecture, just like every other creative thinking practice, works in the world in a special way. Any architecture always responds to the issues of its time and space. But as a creative thinking practice, architecture is in its answers to these issues already, always already an act of jumping from the given situation, an act of distancing from the given reality. It is an act of interruption with the given reality. It doesn't remain within the framework of the given possibilities, but rather acts in the way that with its answers, it opens new yet unknown possibilities. It transgresses the framework of the possible. So here lies a critical capacity of architecture in its ability to transgress the given framework to transgress the framework of the given possibilities. This critical and this critical capacity is a direct consequence of architecture's creative capacity. This is the basic thesis. So it is precisely because of this because of the fact that architecture as a creative thinking practice has specific um, critical capacity, which stems from the way it is constructed, it is built, it is built as an activity. Precisely because of this, I put in the forefront of caring for society and environment, caring for architecture. Because only adequately articulated and practiced architecture is indeed capable of caring for society and the environment in a critical way. This care is not a task that would be imposed on architecture from outside, rather it is its own internal task. It is an architecture task. This is basically my main point. So in order to really care for architecture and for, excuse me, in order to really care for society and the environment, as architects, we need to care for architecture, care for architecture as a creative thinking practice. I also try to outline in this first, first few minutes of, of my presentation, what are the characteristic uh, qualities of this particular practice. The problem, however, is that today, architecture as a creative practice is far from self-evident. It is actually confronted with four ways of understanding and practicing architecture. We could also say that it is confronted with four, let's say, theories of architecture, which have, as every theory does, also they have the practical consequences. 
And these four understandings are actually for architecture as destructive as the instrumental attitude that is generally predominant today is destructive for both the environment and society. This is what I will show in this talk. I will present these four positions, these four theories, these four ways of understanding architecture. And I will also show where the deficiencies of these four positions lie. And based on this, then I will outline a fifth position, a fifth position, which is the way that requires that we insist on architecture as a creative thinking and thus by extension also enables and indeed requires caring for the environment and society. So as, this, as, a, as a starting point of these four understandings of architecture, I'm taking two criteria in which, with, with which the basic criteria, basic why? Because with these two criteria, we can determine, we can define architecture in its basic characteristics. The first criterion concerns the question, how does architecture determine itself? And here we have two options. Either we understand architecture as a practice that is determined by others, that means from some outside, or we understand it as a practice that while being part of its social reality, acting in its social reality, it alone determines itself. The second criteria concerns the question, what is the relation of architecture to that which is outside of it, which is exterior to it, society and the environment? And here we have two options. Is it is architecture a practice that holds a critical position in relation to society and its environmental issues? Or is it a practice that accepts the world as it is? So we can see that like, if we have these two criteria, each has two options. As a result of that, we can define four basic positions in architecture, which means four basic understandings of architecture. And I called them, I gave them names, which I think adequately represent what these positions stand for. And these names are architecture of market logic, architecture of the imperative of invention, architecture of resistance, and architecture of social reform. Now, I will present each of these positions. But the question that will lead me in the, this presentation, in this analysis is the question, the following question. What does this analysis tell us about the possibility of pursuing architecture as an independent practice that is grounded in itself and which at the same time maintains a critical position towards the given society and its relation to the environment? So let's begin with the one the, the understanding which we are very familiar with. It seems actually quite logical, uh, especially if we're not in architecture. And this is architecture of market logic. So for the advocates, I will present now each of these positions. For the advocates of this position, the task of architects is to design buildings and buildings are understood as products. So to design products, buildings that can, that can successfully compete on the market. They have to fulfill various criteria, including the criterion that they have to be environmentally friendly, for instance. This is, this is something that architecture of market logic readily acknowledges. And also they have to fulfill the criteria, the criterion that they take people, that architecture takes people into account. The advocates of these positions like to emphasize that architecture is meant for people, but they tend to understand people in a specific way, as clients, investors, or buyers. These are the people that architecture should serve. As a result, architecture should be that kind that is likable, 
that is like that people like and want. Or then it can be architecture that is generally liked, that is to say, that follows the current trends and fashions. So it's not problematic. It should be something that you can easily recognize as something good as architecture. Um, and not, but not to forget the basic criteria that architecture should fulfill according to this position while taking various other criteria into account. This is financial gain. This is something self-evident for the advocates of this position. For the advocates of this position, buildings, buildings should be successful market products. Why? Because it is the market that ultimately decides whether an activity is necessary or not. And only if architecture can prove itself as a successful competitor on the market, will it also confirm itself as an activity or an industry, as the advocates of this position understand architecture, that is necessary and that is worth investing in. So the, today's world is run or dominated by the logic of the market is for the advocates of this position, neither good nor bad, it is simply a fact. The problem only is that architects are still not willing to accept this fact. Instead, they insist that architecture has some logic of its own. This is what the market, the, the advocates of the position of market architecture are like you know, mockingly referring to. And, and, and instead of like accepting the reality of the world, they, they claim, architects claim that the primary principle around which this logic of architecture turns is creativity. That architects have to be creative. And the advocates of the position of market architecture argue that precisely these and the other similar principles are something that can endanger architecture. Yeah. Why? Because they're nothing but the principles of a self-centered utopian world of architecture in which architects retreat from the real world and the real needs of people. If they won't step out into the real world and act according to its requirements and possibilities, it is not only they who will prove unnecessary, but architecture itself. This is what the advocate of this position argues. Argue architecture itself will simply be replaced by some other industry. To sum up this position, which you see in the right upper corner of this diagram, according to this position, architecture is determined from without. It is determined by the market. And it is a practice of acceptance. It has to be usable and useful for the world in which it operates, which is today, as it happens, the world dominated by the market logic. Okay, let's go to the next position. Okay, just one more illustration of this point. As I said, every theory has its own practical material consequences. I think the practical consequences of this thinking is this kind of environment that we are actually increasingly getting used to, not only in the world capitals such as London, but also in minor cities, of course, in minor um, scale, such as Ljubljana. Next position, I call the architecture of the imperative of invention. This position is located here in this diagram on the left upper corner, and you see what it's orientation basically is, but now I will um, de describe it more in detail. So this position, for the advocates of this position, architecture is an activity that is determined by itself. It alone sets its principles and assigns itself its tasks and defines the production of its objects. And the task that this position puts in the very center of architecture's activity is the invention of the new. For this position, invention is the driving force of architecture. Architects have to be daring and imaginative. They have to experiment with new materials, with new technologies, 
with new techniques, formal solutions. They have to discover new possibilities beyond architecture itself. They have to perform as one uh, formulation, which is a typical description of this position goes, they have to perform a leap into the unknown over and over again. The second characteristic of, for this, of this position is that architecture is not an activity that should critically engage in broader social and environmental issues. Architecture can limit itself to its own disciplinary field. This is the understanding of this position. And in fact, according to this position, this world is not that bad after all. I mean, this world offers incredible technological possibilities. The possibilities that, that were only dreamed about 10 years ago. It, it offers, uh, the, the entire planet is available for new uh, planning and architectural interventions, uh, this position argues. Architects can fly from one construction site to another, from one invention to another. And perhaps most importantly, this work is really, really favors creativity, really favors um, uh, invention. Uh, and as a result, it also favors architecture. So the advocates of this position are inclined to believe that instead of trying to so-called change the world, architects should take advantage of the potentials the world offers and uh, the, the and response to the, these very exciting challenges uh, it presents. So this position is actually a very kind of optimistic position. And I, I think that a very good illustration uh, of this position to which I keep returning and I, I, and, other, and I keep returning because I think it's great is this project, Ordos 100. This is a good illustration because based on this project, we can also see where the central deficiency of the position of the imperative of invention lies. So what is Ordos 100? This is a the screenshot from a documentary movie which was done uh, which was done about this Odos project. So Odos project is basically, uh, it's a concept, uh, it's a project uh, for designing uh, 100 villas in the middle of uh, desert in Inner Mongolia, uh, part of the autonomous um, region of China. The project was curated by uh, the artist Ai Weiwei, architect uh, Herzog de Moron, and uh, they invited 100 architects from, as you can see here, see here from 27 country, countries to come to Ordos. They each got one uh, plot and they were asked to design a villa in a size of 1000 square meters. Why is this a good example? For th three reasons. Why is it an illustrative example of the uh, imperative of invention, again, for three reasons. First, one of the central objectives of the project was to design experimental, very contemporary architecture. Architecture with the potential to break with the established views of what constitutes prestigious residential architecture today. And in the official announcement, the project was explicitly presented as an opportunity for young architects from all over the world to realize their creative capacities, as an opportunity to be maximally inventive. So the architects here, you can see a map of places where the architects flew from and landed in that territory where the invention of architecture was made possible. But, and this is another reason why this is a great, great illustration of the imperative invention, the territory of the maximal invention was in this project very clearly defined. So Odos was basically, the site was a very, Odos, first of all, Odos 100 was defined as a um, complex of luxury villas for rent. The urban plan was done ahead of time. 
It was a very regular urban plan. I will show it later. A conventional grid and on divided into lots. And in each lot, there was a place for one villa of 1,000 square meters. So the architects already got the lot and the place where they should experiment. And the experimentation of the architects involved was limited to the design of individual buildings or more precisely to their conceptual drawings and conceptual models. The architects were expected to focus only on a specific set of questions, those related to the form and spatial configuration of an individual villa. These were considered to be the architectural questions, the ones that belong to the territory of architecture. And within this territory, the architects were expected to be truly fully invented. So this is a, another screenshot from the movie. The idea of the project was, as Ai Weiwei says here, to break the boundary. And this is the, these are the plots you can see that we have to do, we, we have to do it pretty conventional urban planning. And then I found that these statements of a group of architects well summarizes how this project was conceived. And then some of the results of this experimentation. And this was the final result, one of the final results. And here we move to the third characteristics of all those 100, which is the a characteristics of the imperative of invention in general. Whatever the architects tried or succeeded to develop in their designs, whatever they did in the pursuit of their architectural experiments, in the public presentations, this was simply reduced to the experimentation with the forms and spatial compositions of the buildings. The central achievement of the project was in the media described and actually, of course, seen in the unusual character of individual solutions and in the diversity of the proposals. For instance, Art Forum uh, described this project as absolutely radical because every building is different. Every building is more daring and more interesting. And then, and, and, and then they wrote, they designed a villa without distinction between inside and outside, a monolith, a villa of different boxes, unstable forum, a green mountain rising out of the desert and so on. And based on the simple observation that the architects had designed buildings of unusual shapes and treatments. The media declared them contemporary avant-garde. And like in this wallpaper article, presented their projects as a revolutionary housing concept, a revolutionary housing solutions. So the revolutionary avant-garde, the new, was understood in this project simply as that which is the most fascinating of everything that is fascinating, the most daring, everything that is daring, the most different of everything that is different of everything that has ever been done before. The new is measured in this project in terms of the existing, therefore, using the categories and criteria of the given. So the new is more fascinating from everything that is fascinating. It's using this existing criteria to define what is new. Instead of being understood as something, instead of the new being understood as something that intervenes in the very framework of the existing, that interrupts 
breaks the existing thumb within and actually requires new criteria to be defined. What they, what, what this ex so-called experimentation was reduced to in the public presentation of this project is basically that the invention of the new was presented as a production of a great variety of different products, of different objects. And what else is the production of a great variety of different objects, but what the market itself wants, what the logic of the market requires in order to function well. The market always wants something new. New is different, a potentially new market niche again. So here we can see where the key problem of the position of the imperative of invention lies. And again, all those 100 is a good case in point. By isolating itself, by limiting itself to its own disciplinary, disciplinary field, one that could supposedly be separated from the wider social and environmental circumstances in which architecture operates, architecture precisely loses its independence, its capacity to determine itself. So by isolating itself in its own field, it loses its capacity of self-determination. It becomes but a tool or an object of the given circumstances without being able to influence them in any way. As we can see in the case of Ordos 100, architecture is simply turned into but another producer of various revolutionary products, so-called. And this is just like many other industries. It becomes just like many other industries, which also produce their own lines of revolutionary products so-called. For this position, which is basically which is located on the left lower part of this diagram, you can see that it, it um, argues that architecture is determin de determined from within, that it is a practice that determines itself and that it is, or that at least should be a critical practice. So let me now present this position. So architecture is a practice that it self-determines what its main issues are. It self-determines how it should produce its objects. It alone determines what are the, uh, how it should orient itself. What are the, the main, the main, yeah, well, as I said, the main issues that it should respond to. Of course, it always does this in the given space and, and uh, time in which it works. And at the same time, this position argues that architecture is an activity that, that has to take a critical position in relation to society and its attitude towards the environment. It, it has to work according to this position in the direction of changing society for the better. And actually, according to this position, this is the main condition that architecture has to fulfill. This position argues only if architecture acts in a socially critical way, only if it brings positive effects for society and the environment, does it confirm itself as a meaningful practice. So for this position, it is precisely its engagement in working to change society for the better, which actually justifies architecture, renders it meaningful. The problem of this position, however, is that in, in, the, in, in, in our reality, in the reality of the 21st century, there is less and less possibility, less and less opportunities to actually realize such a practice of architecture. So the 
possibilities of practicing what, what is being closed are the possibilities for practicing architecture in the way that it determines itself. Architectural construction, this, the advocates of this position argue, has largely been taken over by investors, real estate consultants, and other so-called experts, and it is no longer in the hands of architects. The architects have appeared to have lost all sense of authority. They have become but servants, servants of the interests of capital, for which there is no such thing as the power of architecture for which there is just the power of profit, the power of numbers. This is an article from the Architectural Review, which uh, comments on the development, recent developments in uh, development in New York, uh, and that points out precisely this problem, which is that, which you who live in London know uh, very well, that basically buildings are um, turning into the, um, into the, um, well, a product that is extremely profitable uh, and, and that causes a, a, a number of negative consequences. Uh, so the, the, the advocates of this position see that, for instance, architects were, were excluded from large scale planning. Uh, from, they don't have any influence on the issues related to infrastructure and so on. Their work is, is increasingly limited to actually designing forms and facades, just like a good example of that is Ordos 100. The facades that try to hide the fact that architecture is disappearing, that it is being replaced by so-called real estate disguised as architecture. This position also sees that, that the possibility for practicing architecture in a critical way are increasingly diminishing, are increasingly disappearing. They are closing as well. The advocates of this position see the main territory for realizing the critical role of architecture in creating better living conditions for the wider population, in caring for a healthy environment, designing residential structures and public spaces, not only for the privileged few, but for the public at large. But today, there are less and less commissions and thus less and less opportunities to develop such projects. Governments no longer invest in quality housing for all like they used to in the middle of the 20th century. And the gov governmental interest in designing quality schools, kindergartens and so on are very much diminishing. So this position is just the opposite in a way from the position of the imperative of invention. It is very, let's say, depressed. They, they really don't have an answer to this development. They increasingly and they increasingly tend to see the only possibility for architecture, the possibility to play both roles, to be practiced as architecture and to work toward the greater well being of society only in some exceptional circumstances, such as remote locations where they, where, as they argue, the real problems that architecture can still solve exist. They find the opportunity for this kind of project largely outside of Europe and the UK, in parts of Africa, Central and South America, in the projects that explicitly work toward improving living conditions for un, un, what they call the underprivileged social groups. This is an exhibition which was organized years ago in MoMA, but is one of the first these big exhibitions which really focused on this particular kind of project. And in this catalog, architecture was described as an instrument of social change, explicitly to which it was added that it is also good architecture, the examples that were presented in the exhibition. So small, yes, we can continue with the instrument of social architecture as an instrument of social change, this exhibition argued, but only in a small scale. If modernists were able to do this in large scale, we can do this in a small scale. But, and then like this is, for instance, like one nice example of the, um, the uh, as I said before, practical consequence of this particular thinking about architecture and also the reception 
in the media which frame this project in a specific way that corresponds to the architecture of resistance. For instance, if you see this emphasized flow, this is a project designed in um, Tanzania by um, a group of female Finnish architects. And in the architectural review, it was explicit, this project was explicitly presented as something that steers away from making any grand artistic statements. Instead, it focuses on empowering the community while respecting the local culture and spatial hierarchy. So this is the architecture that is a good example of what this position fights for. But such cases, the advocates of this position observe are extremely rare. They are, the architecture is confronted, so they are basically confronted with the fact that architecture to which they aspire was possible in the past, in the time of modernism. It is still possible in some remote exceptional locations but in the developed world, in the here and now, architecture has found itself at a dead end. This is what this position has to conclude. So to sum up this position, according to, to, to this view, architecture is an activity that is determined by itself, but to this view, this position adds a condition, an insistence on self-determination of architecture makes sense only if architecture serves society, if it serves the social good. But then the advocates of this position have to see that there's really not many projects that fulfill these two criteria and the architecture of resistance is actually today turning into the architecture of impotent resistance. And this is the fourth position. The fourth position which argues, which is in the diagram uh, located in the place where um, um, it fulfills the, the following two criteria. First, architecture is a practice that should be critical and architecture is a practice that is determined from outside. So let me elaborate. According to this position, we live in a highly problematic world. This is the world of enormous, enormous social disparities, injustices, a world of oceans of poverty on one side and tiny islands of extreme wealth on the other. One sixth of the world's population today lives in circumstances that satisfy the classic definition of slums. And according to this position, in such a world, it is absurd to think that anything significant could be done with architectural means in an architectural way with what they mockingly refer to as architecture with a capital A. It is high time, they argue, that architecture stop focusing on itself and instead address the real problems. And these are social problems such as homelessness, the growing crisis of affordable and appropriate housing, degradation of the environment, the proliferation of slums, and so on. So in tune with this position, architects should get rid of their ideas of creativity and invention, and they should put their knowledge and practice in direct service of the social reform. The problem of this position, however, is that it is facing the fact that the effectiveness of architecture is itself conditioned by the effectiveness of the political and economic programs and projects in which it plays its part. So it can be as critical as the project, projects and, and different programs allow it to be. It can only work within the given, given um, frameworks. And such programs and projects are today only carried out within a very limited scope. This is what uh, this position is facing. The advocates of these positions are aware of the fact that in order to realize serious social reforms, programs on the national and international levels are needed. Such programs that would include, of course, the upgrading of infrastructure, establishing transportation networks, uh, giving the possibility of uh, jobs, education, and so on. But interest in establishing such programs 
as the advocates of this position are obliged to admit, is today very limited. So this is basically what is, I think, a good illustration of this position. The architects that are observing the slums uh, and, and uh, trying to see how they could help. So according to this architecture of social reform, which you see on the lower uh, right part of the diagram, the task of architecture is located outside architecture, out there in society. Architecture is determined from without. And it is or should be critical practice. The advocates of these positions are convinced that architects should put their creative ambitions aside and instead put their technical knowledge and professional expertise, to emphasize once again, into the service of social reform. Although, as they have to admit, this can today be done only within the limited scale. Okay, so what does this analysis, this short analysis tell us about the prospects, the possibilities of practicing architecture as an activity that is determined by itself and at the same time has the capacity to work in a critical way. That is for architecture as a creative thinking practice. So as we can see, architect, both the advocates of the uh, position of social reform and the architects uh, that defend the view of market logic they both already take as a starting point that architecture is determined from the outside. Architecture of social reform claims that architecture is defined, is like finds its justification in social reform, while architecture of market logic sees its the territory in which it has to confirm itself as a meaningful practice. It sees this territory uh, in the market. So we have only two positions that the architecture of the imperative of invention and the architecture of resistance that insist on what? On architecture being self-determining creative practice. Architecture of the imperative invention is not interested in criticality, but at least it, it claims that it is interested in self-determination. But as I tried to show, they both fail in realizing this uh, declaration of architecture as being self-determined. They, they both, uh, none of them is able to show how to realize this vision of architecture, show how such practice of architecture is possible today. So why not? The, architect, the architecture of the imperative of invention isn't able to do this because it closes itself off from the world. And as a result, it becomes its mere object, unable to affect the world. It closes itself in a little bubble and then the world can do whatever it wants with this bubble. As we, I think, was quite clearly or well seen in all those 100. What is the problem of architecture of resistance? Architecture of resistance isn't able to actually show how a self-determination of architecture is possible today because to its requirement of self-determination, it adds a condition. It argues that creative practice of architecture makes sense only if it ultimately serves society, if it serves the social good. It basically cannot stand this radicality, I would say, of the requirement of self-determination of architecture. But it has to say, oh no, but I'm not saying that architecture should serve itself, you know. Architecture, of course, has to serve the social good. It has to serve um, society. It has to be useful for society. And this is what all four positions have in common. Precisely what? That regardless of all the differences, regardless of the fact that they could not in some points more disagree with each other. Regardless of that, they in the last in instance, all ground architecture in the principle of usefulness. 
they all ground architecture in the principle that architecture has to be useful. That is in a principle that is firmly anchored in the given reality. Admittedly, they define usefulness in various ways, as being useful for preserving the market logic or being useful for society. But the society that architecture wants to be useful for is always society as it is today. And this is a society that is itself subordinated to the market logic. This is why the four positions are destructive for architecture as a creative thinking practice. This is why these four theories are really damaging the possibility for architecture as a creative thinking practice. They actually constitute four ways of reducing architecture to instrumental thinking, thinking that in some way serves the given reality, reality as it is. There are four ways of reducing architecture to an activity that is, that is entirely determined by the given reality, to that which the given circumstances and given possibilities allow. Okay, let me move now to, towards the, the end of this presentation. What is then the alternative? An alternative to this is thinking and action that does not seek direct support in reality. So if I said before that what all four positions have in common is that they ground themselves in the principle of usefulness, a principle that is firmly anchored in the given reality, the alternative is to act in the way that you do not seek direct support in reality. but rather starting from a critical attitude towards reality, which means with the open eyes, alone construct that which can work in reality as a firm point of support and a firm foundation for the thinking and action. This is, so this alternative is thinking and action that alone sets its orientation. And this is the creative thinking practice of architecture. I sketched this out briefly in the beginning. Let me now develop this sketch a bit further. So what I will develop now, although just in a form of a sketch, is the fifth position, the fifth way of understanding and practicing architecture, or let's say the fifth way of understanding architecture, which has its practice, practical consequences. So the starting and the reference point of this way of acting isn't again, isn't the given reality itself, but it is something that is for the given reality, something impossible. And what is this? Earlier, I call this an open question or an issue or a set of issues, but we can also designate this with the term idea. The idea as something which is for the given world, for the world as it is, something impossible. Impossible in the sense that it isn't an element of, one, of the world as it currently is, of that world as it exists now. But it is not something beyond the given world either. An idea is actually in this world. In what way? In the way that it operates in the world as the support and driving force of creative action. It exists in the process of, so to speak, creative action at work. And idea, and also this particular way of working has a material existence. For it exists in the form of constructed objects. Idea is not something that exists in the heaven of ideas. Ideas have to be constructed and they have to be constructed in the world and they take the form of a constructed object. As articulations 
these objects, constructed objects, such as buildings, are then articulations of an idea, an articulation of this open question, an open issue. And as articulations of this idea, which is a special moment, again, it is not in the world, it is not an element on the, of the world, but it is not something beyond the world. It's a point of the world which always needs to be articulated still again and again. So the constructed objects, which are articulations of this special moment, are as a result objects of a special kind. They're object, objects that, once they're placed in the given world, can function as a kind of a glitch, a disruption. A disruption of the given architectural codes of the entrenched ways of constructing of the established ways of living. They disrupt us in our routine existence. How? They invite us to open our eyes in order to truly see, which means, what does it mean to truly see? It means that we also think about what is that we see. They invite us to sharpen our attention in order to truly hear, which means that we also think about what is that we hear. They incite us to activate our critical and self-critical, in, in other words, our creative thinking capacity. So potentially these objects open a possibility that we can be in the world differently, that we can be in the world in the way that we look in order to see and listen, in order to hear and think, in order to understand. So the creative thinking practice of architecture doesn't aim at designing, does not aim at designing likable or fashionable objects nor does it aim to design the objects that are different from everything that has ever been done before. It aims to designing objects that open a possibility that we can be in the world differently. That we can take that minimal distance in relation to the given reality, which enables us to see that, which is today very difficult to see. And, and, and what is this? It is the fact that it's possible to act in other and different ways from the ones that the given social order not only offers, but essentially prescribes to us. This is what architecture can do, just like every other creative thinking practice, different arts, philosophy, also science. If I conclude now by returning to the beginning, today it is very clear that architecture should, again, also take care of the environment and society. But this care has to be understood correctly. It doesn't mean that architecture should accept the role of instrument of solving social issues as they are, such as the proliferation of slums. It doesn't mean that you should accept the role of an instrument helping save the environment. If I go to show one particular example of environment and, and society in which we live today, a, a slum in uh, Sao Paulo. So again, sorry, I, I should better focus. So architecture should take environment and society into account. It should care for both of these dimensions of society. But this doesn't mean that it should accept the role of instrument of solving social issues or the role of an instrument helping save the environment. Why? Because architecture does not have the capacity or power to do this, but it has some other capacity and power. Again, the power to open up the possibility that we can see and understand the world differently 
from what the predominant instrumental logic of profitability gives us to see and understand. Thus, we can, for instance, see that it is about time that we leave behind the statement, more precisely, the presupposition successfully propagated by Margaret Thatcher in the 1980s. The statement, there is no alternative. Instead, we should take another statement and position it as our starting point. And this is the position that our world is in fact structured as an open structure. That is, as a structure that can be changed. And that we too are involved in the question what this world is and what it should be. The answer to the question whether there is an alternative or not, therefore, depends also on us. An architecture, if it realizes itself in the world as a creative thinking practice, can help us to see this. So now, really, to conclude, I will return to the four positions. They represent actually four strategies that deny this capacity and this power of architecture. The first group does this by directly reducing architecture to a practice that should compete on the market. The second one does this by reducing creativity simply to the production of ever new products, new as different. The third group retreats as I said, from the radicalness of its own requirement that architecture be a self-determining practice and hurries to convince us that, that in our highly unjust world, creativity can only be something secondary. And the fourth group directly opposes creativity as something that architecture should discard so that it can focus on its true task, which is to help the poor, the oppressed, and the exploited. But this must be added. This view precisely excludes the capacity that architecture as a creative practice has. And this is the capacity that it addresses this poor, oppressed, and exploited in the same way as it addresses all human beings. That it invites them to find support in themselves and in their own creative thinking capacities, in their own capacities to think and act independently. And it is this position that is the starting point of every social change. Okay, thank you. This is what... That was wonderful. Thank you so much, Petra. I'm going to lead the way with a hand clap on Zoom. Um, but that was just absolutely fascinating. You might want to have a glass of water or something now after speaking <laughs> for so yeah. long. Okay. <laughs> um, so whilst um, uh, those listening sort of take a moment to, to think about any questions they might like to ask, um, can I ask you a few of my own? Please, yes, Fran. thank um, you. So, uh, the fifth position that you discuss as an alternative to the four positions you so clearly defined, can you tell us a little bit more about how that is discussed in the book and how it might be adopted by those that are listening? Yeah, yeah, thank you. I, I, that's, um, that's, a, that's a good opening for, for telling more about this position, which I only described briefly in my, in my lecture, in my talk. Um, well, just first, I would just like to maybe make clear something which I'm not sure that it is clear. These four, these four positions are actually four ways of seeing architecture. And uh, there are four, I would also, as I call them, theories of architecture, which, as I showed at the end, are actually working against architecture as a creative thinking practice. So we do not have four kinds of architecture and then the fifth kind, but we have this thinking in the world that, that's, that blocks um, the creative thinking practice of architecture. So I, what, I, what I tried to more, like what I did in the book is basically I started with these four positions 
And then uh, I showed that architecture is, if we look at this diagram, if we think within these four options, if we think about within this duality of determined from inside, determined from outside, either critical towards society or not critical, if we think within this framework, we cannot actually see any other option but these four. So in the book, I tried to show that in order to move away from this particular thinking, which has four variations, but it's basically the same, and it shows the, the points to the crisis of architecture, to the impossibility of architecture, in order to do that, we need to, um, leave this whole um, definition of um, this diagram, actually we need to leave this diagram behind. And we need to start from something which is the point of the impossible, which is the point uh, which is at the same time, which you can say that it is articulated in the world as something that does not belong to this world. Basically, I, I think I made it even more complicated, but I try. <laughs> 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 Wonderful. Um, and why why do you, why is it necessary to develop such an elaborate theoretical study of the creative practice of architecture? Um, it, isn't it enough to simply act creatively as an architect? I, I guess the question is why do we actually need theory? Yeah, this is this is a this is a question which I kept returning to in my book. This is also the question that I've been facing as a teacher because schools of architecture are uh, environments in which architecture is primarily understood as a design practice. So as it, it is basically accepted that theory is needed, uh, but it's not very really clear why. <laughs> so I, when I was thinking about this question, I was thinking about this question also in order to justify my own position because it is theory that I teach. So why do we need theory? Uh, I think that actually we can see that well in this Ordos project. We can see in the sense that if architecture only, if architects only practice architecture in a creative way, then it's so easy to appropriate their production for some other goals because they don't, somebody else is going to tell what is that they are doing. So they're doing something. And then somebody else, if, and, and architectural theory is part of the practice because if the practice of design is producing something, architectural theory is uh, developing or telling what it is that it is producing. If architecture alone doesn't do this, somebody else will. And today, as we see, the market is very loud in articulating what architecture does. It is producing an interesting, amazing products, amazing real estate, very profitable real estate. Mm -hmm. So basically, Architectural theory is inseparable part of architectural practice in a way that it thinks the practice in a conceptual way. Wonderful. Thank you very much. I'll just um, encourage anyone listening, if you'd like to ask a question, please do put it in the chat box um, and um, I'll be able to read it out. Don't hold back. Um, the title of the book is The Resistant Object of Architecture, A Lacanian Perspective. How does the work of Jacques Lacan inform your work in this book? Yeah, I started to talk about that in, when I was responding to the first question. Mm. Uh, simply in order to define this very actually strange way of working and at the same time, characteristically human way of working, which is creative thinking you have to leave behind this established today, very common way of understanding the world, which is thinking the world within the dualities, inside, outside, for instance, um, then uh, phenomenon uh, like the core and the, the expression of that and, and, and so on. So 
if we want to define, if we want to outline the possibility and, and, and uh, develop in a theoretical way, elaborate on this possibility in an elaborate, elaborate way, uh, the possibility of creative thinking, we have to uh, start from a different theoretical um, position. So we have to leave behind the logic of two inside, outside, which forms a whole. And we have to move to the logic, which is among other uh, thinkers developed by Lacan, which is the logic of there's always, there is no hole, basically. There's always some otherness that keeps opening every hole. That's one thing I would say. And the second thing is, what was essential for me was that um, the concept that developed by, by Lacan, the particular way of working, which, is, uh, which he defined as the drive, the drive is basically the way of working, which I think is characteristic for architecture and for architects and for all creative activities. Okay, since, since you asked me this question, I would also like to point out that I am basing my, my theory on the uh, interpretation of Lacan, which was developed in Slovenia, uh, in so-called uh, Ljubljana Lacanian school, and in particular on a philosophy of philosopher Radoviha, who was uh, who actually uh, developed uh, the idea of creative thinking based on a uh, combination of Kant, Lacan, and Badiou. So these are, this is my theoretical framework, also Alain Badiou. Fantastic, fantastic. Thank you so much. It's it, yeah, it's it's fascinating. Right, I have one question left, and so I would urge the audience if there's anything that you want to ask, now is the time. Because once I've asked this question, if there's nothing in the chat box, we we're gonna um, draw things to a close. Um, so my final question to you, Petra, is. Um, one reviewer described the book as providing a courageous alternative to yet another gloomy account of architecture's impossibility to act, which I, I love. Um, what do you hope our audience takes away from the talk today? Yeah, well, I basically my main, yeah, I hope that um, I think that it is time to leave behind this position that every critical attitude in our world turns into its opposite. That basically the position that nothing can be done, that there's this machine that holds us all in its, uh, in its, uh, like, in its mechanism, that we are totally um, blocked by it, that we can do whatever we want, but actually change that the world won't change. We are completely caught in it. So this is this current ideology of today's world. Uh, and, and it is also pretty present in architecture. It is present in the position which I find the most relevant of the four positions, which is the position of resistance. They want resistance, but they see they, well, too bad, it can't be done. So to that, I, I follow a, an alternative position, which is, um, well, where, where you can, if you don't have any support in the reality for our critical action, then you have to build your own support. So if the conditions don't allow you to be critical, well, then you have to put out your own hypothesis and try to develop it, try to elaborate it. And this is the firm point of your action and it is the driving force of your action and as as uh, philosopher Jacques Rancière would say in such a position there is much more power and much more joy than being like fascinated by the majestic machine of capitalism that keeps us all in its claws. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Uh, we have got a question from the audience um, from Tim Miles. He says, hi, um, in your opinion, should we build, should we be building higher and higher, go under or spread out? Well, I, I actually think that this, uh, um, that I, I cannot actually give an answer. So 
<laughs> first of all, thank you for your question. I think that high or spread it or what was what were the questions? Should we build higher and higher? Yes. Um, uh, go under or spread out. Uh -huh. Higher and higher, go under or spread out. I think that these are not values. That this is not good or bad in itself. I think that how to whether we should do one or the other or the third way has to be always thought in a concrete project in a concrete situation. And I don't think that high is necessarily bad, no under is good or, and, and so I, I think that's as much as I can say about this question, but maybe I didn't. No, that's excellent. Um, we've got another question. Um, the person, I will butcher their name, so I won't do them that dishonor, but um, from Vid. Petra, thank you for your amazing talk. The four presented positions seem rather deterministic and archetypical schools of thought in the field that you presented in your talk. Could this fifth position be understood as non-position or rather could one understand that there is a parallel non-field of resistance that breaks through the neoliberal architectural field? Frank, can you ask the, just the question again, please? Sure. Petra, thank you for your amazing talk. The thank four, you, Rita. I just wanted to, you know, repeat that. The four, <laughs> the, the four presented positions seem rather deterministic and archetypical schools of thought in the field that you presented in your talk. Could this fifth position be understood as non-position, or rather, could one understand that there is a parallel non-field of resistance that breaks through the neoliberal architectural field? Well, I, I think that this is very much a position. Uh, why it is a very much a position? Because this is something that needs to be fought for. This possibility of cre creative thinking in this world is something that needs to be fought for in this world. The whole world is done, is like structured in the way that would rather not have that, uh, or that would like to have that simply as a creative industry as part of the, like included as part of the machine. So, so it is, I don't know what you meant with non-position, but if you, if you, if I understand, if I understand the position as something that one has to hold, develop, fight for, then I would say the fifth, fifth way, which is creative thinking practice of architecture is very much a position. Now, there it is it doesn't exist in a parallel reality because if it existed in some parallel reality it wouldn't be influence, able to influence the given reality and 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 thank you for this um for for pointing to this dimension of what i'm trying to say because now i can clarify myself creative thinking practice is very much part of the world and this is but the strength of this practice is that it is part of the world in the way that it gives itself its own orientation, but it gives itself its own orientation in one particular sense, that it's led by an idea as something that this that, that the architecture, no individual architect is entirely in charge of. So it is led by something that always needs to be articulated again and again in the world. It, it remains something in a way, it remains something impossible. And that's why it keeps opening the world. Thank you very much. And um, Tim, thank you for um, trying to answer his question as well. Uh, we've got another one from Annie Vartola. She says, hi Petra and greetings from Helsinki to you all. Hello. Uh, how would you comment viewpoints that argue that architecture should not address or even discuss social problems at all? Architecture should be about uh, should be about building beautiful, sustainable, usable buildings and cities, and that's all. I vaguely recall such a debate against a statement view of architecture from the 1990s, and I think it's gaining strength again. Would you like me to repeat, or are you okay? I think I'm okay, yeah. Ani, thank you very much for this question. Well, I find that very problematic position. Uh, I think an architect has to be aware of the world in which she operates. And that means in every and each project. 
But of course, there are projects in which you cannot really address social issues in very explicit way. And there are pro projects in which you cannot explicitly uh, address environmental issues. Uh, and I still think that those projects can be good examples of architecture. So what I would respond now just briefly to your question is that I find it very problematic if architecture encloses itself in its own disciplinary field, which is basically, I think, what, what you presented as a, current, as a current trend more and more. And I, I agree, this is a current trend. And this is one way of destroying the power of architecture. Thank you so much. Right, I shall wait a second just to see if there's anybody furiously typing out uh, anything further, um, but I don't think there's anything further coming through. So all that remains to be said is an enormous thank you, Petra, for um, taking the time to, to do this tonight. It was absolutely fascinating and entirely enjoyable, and I'm sure everybody who joined was delighted. So enormous thanks, and thank you to everybody who joined us um and you've got a few clapping hands going up um and people in many many thanks petra bravo thank you for your talk very very insightful and so forth thank you thank you very much Fran, and thank you all for for being here um and um thank you all for your excellent questions so it was wonderful thank you so much bye everyone see you soon Bye.